And here we go. Welcome to this uh, DarwinX webinar in which we'll explain the difference between a Darwin and a trading strategy. This uh, webinar will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel. And uh, further, the presentation on which it's based has been uploaded as a handout into the handout area in GoToWebinar for you to download as you see free. I think it will also be emailed uh, as the summary together with the, the video. So my name is Juan. I'm one of the co-founders with DarwinX. And uh, today we're going to explain what the Darwin is. So what is it? Some people are maybe not 100% familiar with the, with the concept. I'll try to explain why we've created the Darwin asset from the standpoint of a trader, which is the, as you know, Darwin X is uh, by and for traders. Traders are a lifeblood. But also, uh, we, we very much need traders to work in alignment with both ourselves and the investors. So we'll explain the investor take. And uh, last but not least, I'm sure a lot of you are trying to wonder how one of the the, the bit that transforms the strategy into the Darwin works. That bit is called the Darwin Risk Manager. It's a piece of software that we've built, and I'll do my very best to explain uh, the principles with which it operates. Uh, feel free to ask me any questions. I'll try and tackle as and when we go through the the uh, presentation. Uh, if I see that one of them is either going to be covered later or is outside the scope, uh, we will try and tackle at the end of the webinar, where I've reserved any time you need for uh, Q&A. So, Let's get going. So if I had to summarize, and I believe I have to summarize quite often as the CEO of the company, what a Darwin is, uh, well, think of it as an IETF or a hedge fund as a service that you can use to tap investors, uh, all for the price of your brokerage revenues with DarwinX. So um, as a matter of fact, I am... I mean, it's not that I did this, but I'm actually very, very proud to have seen today the first Darwin that has crossed the 3 million assets under management uh, investor figure on top of the 220,000 euros that we invest ourselves. So THA has actually crossed that figure. And the, the most remarkable thing about uh, that is that it took seven months for uh, THA to get to the first million. It took about three months to go from one to two, and it's taken about three weeks to go from two to three. As a matter of fact, we are actually in com conversations with the, 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 the provider of the Darwin because it looks as though this will be the first Darwin that we will have to close for new investment. So for... For us at the team here at DarwinX, we've worked very, very hard to make this thing even work. I mean, people thought we were crazy back when we invented the Darwinia thing uh, or even Darwin or DarwinX. I mean, they must be thinking we're some sort of video game company. And uh, now it's no longer just a, a potential idea. It's actually that's something that's combined investors and traders uh, to provide somebody with potentially a pretty good livelihood, as we shall see throughout the presentation. So if I don't know if THA is actually attending the webinar today. If he is, my heartfelt congratulations, because you, you've basically, you know, it's a, it's a small step for, for capital markets, but it's a huge step for, I presume, yourself and all of the DarwinX community. All right, so enough celebration. As we said, that's what a Darwin is. Uh, now, why did we think that the world needed another set of acronyms back when we invented DarwinX? Well, because we saw that we think, we strongly believe that independent traders are an asset class in the making, but there are currently three core problems that separate the traders on the right-hand side from potentially invest investors who are sitting and seeing their cash do bugger all in their accounts and are looking for alternative asset classes, but do not really trust the trader asset class because there's a gap in visibility, credibility, and trust. And I shall explain what I mean by that, both from the standpoint of the trader initially and from the investor later on. So from the standpoint of a trader, um, we see a Darwin as the, the missing link in their evolution. So when you first start trading, what you're thinking of doing is, well, you know, I'll try and maximize the return on my personal capital. And then you keep going at it for a while until, you know, eventually you realize, oh, you know, maybe this is going well, but I've got an issue. And that is 
if I trade my capital, there's no way I can make a living from this unless I take crazy risk, in which case I can blow up my capital. So I'm kind of caught between the devil and the deep blue sea unless I learn about this very, very powerful concept, which I encourage you to kind of read a, a YouTube video on that I did a while ago. It's seven minutes, and I think it's probably my best YouTube video to, to date. It's called Compound Investor Leverage. You can look it up on, on, on YouTube. And that basically explains that if you trade peanuts, your own capital, you make peanuts, and there's no way you can make a living from trading. So the only viable way to grow up as a trader and basically close that missing link in your evolution is to start charging a 20% success fee on investor money. And then the numbers do add up regardless of what your account size is initially, because as we've seen, if you do things well, 3 million of investors, and that is proven now, will track you, your Darwin. So let's get going with the trader view. Visibility, as I mentioned, credibility, trust, uh, the intellectual property protection, as we shall see, and the, the fact that we are regulated by the FCA is a, a, an important landmark and a viable business model. So note that we've called this webinar the difference between a strategy and the Darwin, and these are the core four differences between trading your own strategy and managing an investable Darwin. So let's see how we work through that. So... Why did we create DarwinX? Well, actually, uh, you probably some of you guys know, this goes back to two siblings, myself and my brother. And my brother was back in the days a trade leader in a bunch of online services, including eToro, uh, currency, and pretty much anything else. You know, he, he had been doing, he'd been trading for a while. He was consistently profitable. He was, a, he, he was and is a swing trader. Uh, and he was massively pissed off. Why? Well, because... Uh, at pretty much all the leak tables in these online services, he was consistently number 50 in, le in the leaderboard. Um, and that would have been okay if the 50 guys above him had been any good. The problem is there was always 50 lucky monkeys who were lucky for uh, enough time to figure out uh, top of the leaderboard for a while until, of course, they blew up. And, you know, my brother, the, 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 it was like a washing machine where the top 50 guys kept changing all the time, uh, kept taking investor money and burning investor money, as, as you saw before. And my brother didn't really get to land what he thought he deserved. So back in 2012, uh, we invented a company called TradeSlide. And there we set out to trying to tell a skilled trader, which we think is an owl, because an, an owl is a predatory, you know, it's a predator that waits, uh, observes, and kills without anyone noticing. We think that's a pretty good analogy for a trader. And essentially a lucky chicken who essentially is a fraud who's been lucky for a while, but he's just been lucky, not nothing else. So uh, back then is when we started with a toolkit, which is today's investable attributes. So the 12 things you see in... Um, um, the, the, the 12 grades we provide in here that we summarize into Darwin X Core, that, that was the first product that Darwin X built before we were even a broker or we built a, a risk manager on which more later. The goal was to give visibility to those who deserve that visibility. And you can actually look up the video and that's called the Trade Side Score in, in, in YouTube. It, it explains pretty well the philosophy of what we do to this day. So first point, visibility. Uh, if you are trading your strategy, you get no visibility amongst the lucky punters. If you're trading your Darwin, uh, you eventually do because it's designed to tell for uh, to, to diagnose for skill instead of for just re returns. So that's first point, visibility. That's a point. Then second and possibly most importantly, the core difference that investors value in a Darwin when you are there. Darwin provider on the on the right hand side is the alignment. So how do investors know that your track record is true if you are the person who's basically promoting your track record? Well, you need a third party who certifies that the results are true and that party has to be independent from you for this whole thing to be credible. And we are that third party. So one of the roles we play in the middle is that the person that is offering the Darwin is independent from you. Furthermore, the 
the agent that is offering the Darwin is not yourself. It is an FCA regulated asset manager who holds an asset management license and is has a, a regulatory permission to charge a 20% fee from investors who thus keep 80% of the profits they get by replicating your intellectual property and you start to earn 20%. So another core difference between a Darwin and a strategy is that if you were to offer the strategy directly in your own name, you would have to be regulated as an asset manager or you would be in breach of regulations in most jurisdictions worldwide. So we offer you a 100% free in the sense that it is included in the brokerage charge we we impose on you to uh, enjoy our umbrella to tap into, into investors. And last but not least is the fact that I think to this day, we are one of the very, very few venues in the retail space that only incentivize the managers on success. So there's no incentive for the trader that is providing a Darwin other than earning success. And that makes you credible with the investors because the investors know, okay, well, this guy is going to try his very best, not only because he only gets success, but also because actually he's risking his own skin. So Darwins only are provided on live strategies precisely for that reason, because you are only credible if you're risking your own money alongside investor money. If there's any questions on... Okay, so I see there's a, there's a question here already. Apologies, uh, that's taking me a while. Uh, so there's a question here, why the 3 million Darwin to be closed for investors? And the reason we uh, we will very likely, well, actually not us, that, and here's, here's the another piece of alignment. So first of all, we are not going to be the ones who close the Darwin. It will be the Darwin provider himself. And why is it in the Darwin provider's interest to close his Darwin? That is because he only gets paid uh, on success. Now, the Darwin who has now reached the 3 million trades typically in news and it trades with some leverage in the sense that it will be sending with three millions a pretty sizable amount of uh, liquidity to the market. So, so much so that whilst the average investor still makes money, the marginal investor, so the one dollar that comes on top of the three million is no longer making any profit. Furthermore, it's probably making a loss and that loss is eating into the success fee that all investors pay the trader. So basically, the payout that the trader gets has peaked at 3 million assets under management, and it is not in his interest, not an investor interest, and not in Darwin's interest for him to take any more until perhaps we find better ways to place the 3 million in the market, in which case it would be in his interest and ours and investors for him to open up for more investment. So... I hope Alexander that clarified the thing, but that is a further proof of the power of alignment. So it's uh, he has reached three million, and his investors, his new investors, do not want to join. His existing investors do not want any new new investors to join, and he doesn't want any first investor to to join, let alone Darwin X, because obviously this would be de destroying our reputation. So Alexander is asking, and this is a very good point. So if you take money out from your Darwin and later create a Darwin with that equity using a, an MT4 account, it's fine, but it has to be trading at different times than the original Darwin, because otherwise it's going to face the same problem. It's going to be eating into the same liquidity. So there's no way around uh, the fact that that strategy has reached capacity, which is the, the issue. I hope that clarifies it. If not, we can deal with it at the, at the Q&A. But that's a very important example of alignment. So... This is another point which was particularly painful for me uh, back in the day. So uh, I'm showing here the uh, the chart from a, a competitor of ours called uh, well, MyFX Book. I'm sure you all know MyFX Book. And this is possibly one of the most profitable strategies in MyFX Book. This is, a, I think the trader's name is Jeff, and he, he trades under FX Viper. Uh, and he offers uh, this in, in various MAM accounts uh, over, over places. Now, we had a, a pretty ugly row uh, two years ago, I, th I believe it was, because um, the well, one of the persons that marketed FX Viper accused DarwinX of allowing a signal subscriber of FX Viper to list a Darwin in his own name. So let's say, you know, let's say Alexander is a super trader uh, and 
and he's the trader behind FX Viper. And I, Juan, I am a subscriber of FX Viper, which means I get the signals for me to execute FX Viper's uh, trades in my account. Uh, and because I'm very smart and I see that I'm making money and I know that at Darwin X, I can get, say, 3 million of investment, then what I do is I trade an account in my own name, not Alexander's name, at Darwin X, and I pocket the success fees from Darwin X investors, which de facto amounts to stealing, uh, in a way, from Alexander. Okay, so that's the issue we had. Uh, and this was like two years ago. So a lot of people go, it is not important to... It's okay to copy trade because people will not go through the hassle of uh, going behind my back to, to save the success fee. And the answer is, well, most people will not bother if your strategy is shit. But if your strategy is good, sooner or later, you're going to find somebody who figures this out and will t- take essentially will take the piss out of you. And that is the reason why at THA, you can buy THA, but there's no way you will know what his live trades are. Because if you knew, you would be stealing into his three million of assets under management. I hope I really made that clear. But and the only way to do that is if you wrap it up in a Darwin. Because if you want to go and bypass the law to manage assets and go to some some sort of copy trading signal, well, maybe you will be on the gray zone that allows you to manage third-party money for a while until the regulator shuts you down. But in the meantime, you will be leaking your intellectual property to investors which makes it even worse, okay? So I hope that makes it more or less clear. That's a very important point on the on the intellectual property. That's another key difference between a Darwin and a strategy. So you have to choose. Either you market the strategy illegally, in which case you leak intellectual property, or you protect intellectual property, but then people don't really have the trust in you because there's no third party monitoring what you're doing. So it's kind of a catch-22 that you can only use if you basically list a strategy on some sort of strategy exchange. Okay. Uh, So, yeah, uh, another point on capacity, which we've got here to close things off with Alexander. So Alexander is basically saying that, uh, you know, he thinks his strategy can trade bigger sizes than our current capacity estimate. And that may may very well be the case. We haven't really focused on optimizing the capacity measures for strategies because it wasn't the problem up to now. Now that we have successfully gotten to the point where a Darwin is big enough to close it, then obviously the focus is going to be on how much can the best strategies actually take, which is, you know, means that the, the asset is already gathering traction. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, I mean, I'm not sure I can even mention this, but a lot of our uh, Darwin providers we have attracted from MQL5, uh, and those guys were sharing their signals for something like 20 bucks a month with uh, hundreds of guys. And they were essentially giving using a very inefficient way to market their intellectual property. And back in the days, we were making this argument, but we couldn't really kind of prove our our point, but now we can. Now, let's run some numbers here, okay? If you manage 3 million of assets under management and you make a 67% in 2017, on which you charge a 20% success fee, I mean, let's do the odd numbers here. So, this is 13.4, 13.4% of 3 million is roughly $400,000 for the year of 2017. Okay, so I mean, you're not going to buy a, a big yacht on this, but I mean, I for sure would be making a far better living than I am doing right now as a guy who's bootstrapping on a, um, a company. All right, so, you know, Darwin's, a lot of people tell us Darwin's are a nice idea. Well, they were a nice idea, I think, back in the day. Now they're actually a model which I believe is superior to many of the alternatives because, as I've mentioned, it's credible, it's legal, and it protects your intellectual property in ways that you don't get from EAs, MAMs, and, and so on. And I will be discussing this in an upcoming webinar. Okay, so with that, short of how the risk management works, which is something I will explain a bit later in the presentation, I would have covered what I think are the core differences from the standpoint of a trader. Are there any questions at this point? Okay, looks like we're good. Fantastic. So let's keep going. So from the standpoint of an investor, um, 
I, you know, basically, we our mission as a company is to be the bridge between traders and investors. Now, this is a bit of a lengthy one to explain and possibly warrants a webinar. But as you guys probably know, DarwinX is a pure broker. As when I mean a pure broker, I mean we do not stand to win anything other than the commissions that our customers pay us. So if our customers lose money against the market because they pay us to send the trades to the market, then their money is gone forever from us. Now, the fact that we, unfortunately, the, the fact is that most traders tend to lose money. And when you deliberately waive a revenue source, which is to be book against traders, what happens is obviously you are possibly a more honest or a more aligned proposition, but unfortunately you have a lower margin than your dealing competitors. Now, if you have a lower margin than your dealing competitors, then very likely you are not in a position to advertise to bring in new customers through the door, which means your way to survive in the long run is not to acquire customers and let them burn because that makes you a profit, but rather you have to acquire customers and keep them there for life. Now, so we are what we're doing here as a, as a company is we're trying to get good traders like THA who trade, say, you know, 20, 30, 40,000, 50,000 euros in their account. Of course, as they grow their accounts, that, that account grows. So we turbocharge the growth in our best customers' accounts. And furthermore, we bring volume to the business which we wouldn't otherwise acquire because the people who are investors by definition are not traders themselves. So for a company like DarwinX, unless we get investors to work and to win, we're dead. Okay, so I can't really explain that, you know, if we lose the traders or the investors, then this bridge falls down into the abyss and we're gone. Okay, so that is a very, very important point to make because that's our very number one, number two, number three, and four incentive. Okay, so from our standpoint, we absolutely need the investors to very, very efficiently find the most skilled traders very, very quickly. Okay, now obviously, those investors will only deposit size with us uh, if they have the most trust and the biggest guarantees. So that is why we sought to be regulated by the FCA and are basically subject to the most stringent regulatory standards in the asset management industry and why we only work on profit. Now, there's two ways, there's two things to keeping your customers satisfied. The first one is return on capital. So you want to make sure you have the best traders with you. But even before that, the foundation to that is the return of capital. As I'll mention in a second, there is the absolute necessity to manage investor risk independently from the traders. So if you go into a hedge fund, hedge funds employ traders in the front office. So that, th those guys are so-called the, the strikers in the team. Those guys, the, their, their role is to take risks and make goals. But every football team needs a defense, which basically makes make sure when all the strikers are up the field trying to score a, a, a goal and they lose the ball, there has to be somebody at the back who makes sure your your you know your, your goal stays empty because otherwise you've lost the game. So for us, we need a risk management function, and we have built that. That is the so-called risk manager. We'll discuss in a, a bit later, and that is the only way to provide investors reassurance that they are not going to be looking stupid when a trader does something silly. And, and you know, traders do think silly things at times. And last but not least, uh, the one thing that we are I probably proudest of is the fact that um, investors for DarwinX are now turning better and better results uh, in in their in their investment portfolio. So uh, so much so that I, I dare say some of the top traders are already an emerging asset class. I think THA is the first of, uh, example amongst hopefully more to follow. But if you look around down the ranks, you can see some guys who have been making good consistent profits for several years in the making already. Okay, so I mean, uh, how uh, this is a tough one to, to convey. This is a chart that we use in investor presentations for our, for our company. But if, if you think of, of DarwinX, uh, the way we look at investors is we're not trying to make any money. And when I say any money is, I mean, no money from investors. Why? Because we want investors to make the most return for their capital because a happy investor 
brings you more investors. And the more investors we have, the more easily we source traders. So for us, traders are data that we sell to investors. And from our standpoint, there's no value in the investors because our ambition as a company is to have the best traders trading for us. If we succeed there, the, the rest of the investors will follow. From your standpoint as an investor, what this means is you're paying ridiculously low fees in terms of commissions. So as you know, we charge a $50 round trip per million fee on, on uh, traded volumes. And we also have uh, diversification rebates whereby the more Darwin's investors put in a portfolio, the bigger a share of our commissions we rebate back to the, the, the investors, which means the traders really do keep 20% net of all costs there without any things like uh, paying rebates or paying uh, investor volumes to the traders because that would encourage churn. So as, a, as an investor, you know, the traders are fully 100% on your side, and DarwinX isn't taking any cut pretty much whatsoever in terms of the amount of volumes you're, you're making. So that was the point on the investors. And of course, I, I can imagine by this point, everybody's really thinking, okay, Juan, yeah, we know the core difference between a Darwin and a strategy is the risk management. So please just get on with it and explain you know, how the whole thing works. Okay, so uh, I'll just have a quick look at uh, a couple of questions that we had outstanding from Alexander. If anybody else has anything relating to investors, please go ahead and ask now and I'll try and tackle. Okay. So there's a question on Alexander, and this, this one is actually a topical one. So uh, a lot of traders go and say, oh, you know, back when I started my strategy, I wasn't as good as I am now. I want to delete my history to kind of look more appealing in investors' eyes. Now, I can tell you what I think as an investor. I don't know what others think. But from my standpoint, to me, a guy who has started losing and eventually got to a point where he was at break even and then who has evolved into a situation where he's actually making profits, to me, that guy is a whole lot more credible than a guy who basically started like a, you know, like a upward line to the top and beyond, because I can see a person that's trying really hard to improve and succeeding and building the habits and the skills to succeed. I am much more likely to buy somebody with a shit history for two years, who an okay third year and an upward looking fourth year, because I can tell, well, this guy is somebody who is giving, you know, is keeping at it. He's already four years under his belt and now he's turned a corner and he's making profits. So in answer to your question of whether we plan to allow people to just show the curve from the standpoint where it starts looking good, to be honest with you, I don't think that's in anyone's interest, starting with the traders. So the answer is no, there's no plan for that. And I think there's a good reason, which I, I think I've just explained. So in the long run, I think we're all better off if we show it like it is, 100% transparency, because that will mean that we're all more credible collectively. There's no point in trying to sh shove shit under the carpet. Okay, so let's keep going with the, the risk manager. Now, this one is a tricky one to explain because a lot of people do not really understand what risk means. So... It's not like I'm trying to be pedantic here, but I think we have to agree on the terminology here. And um, and the best way I can think of explaining this, and if somebody comes up with a better one, I'll be very, very, very happy to listen because I, I don't think it's easy and uh, it's certainly not easy for me. So, uh, so when you talk about a car, uh, people talk about two types of safety. One is active safety, the kind that prevents an accident. So it's the one that makes sure that you know, you only really have an accident when it's completely unavoidable. That's active sa safety. And then there's pass uh, uh, what would that include? That would include the brakes. That would include, uh, you know, the, the the engine in order to overtake. If you have to overtake, that would include, you know, the, the wheels uh, and a bunch of things that make sure that, you know, you minimize the chance of having an accident. That I call active um, safety. Then the other bit is, of course, Passive safety. Sometimes, you know, shit happens, unfortunately. And when shit happens, you want to make sure you have an airbag to make sure you survive it. Okay. So where does the analogy to trading apply? Well, there's three elements. The first one, which is obvious, well, it's less obvious, is no one in his right mind 
tries to ca crash his car on purpose. Okay, as we shall see, when you're trading investor money uh, or you're trying to deceive investors into backing you with their own money, that is the question of whether you have the wrong incentive. So you might have, for some reason, an incentive to do something which doesn't fit in the analogy, which is to crash the car. Now, forget about that. We'll talk about that in a second. But meanwhile, there are two elements here that apply totally. So what is active safety when it comes to trading? Well, active safety, <coughs> forgive me, is trading low leverage. Why? Because if you trade low leverage, there's a lower chance of a big market move making you lose a lot of money. Of course, you can say, yeah, but then I've got a stop loss. And in the stop loss, if you know, even if I trade a lot of leverage, then you know, I've got a, a guaranteed stop to my loss. Well, a stop loss in this analogy is the airbag, airbag in the passive safety situation. Okay, Shit didn't really hit the fan, but some shit did happen because you've locked in the loss with the stop loss. Okay, is that analogy clear? It's very important because otherwise we're not going to understand each other and what follows. <coughs> so active safety is low leverage. Passive safety is your stops because the low leverage prevents the disaster from happening in the first place. The stop loss only mitigates it. Okay. If somebody disagrees or has a question, please interrupt because otherwise we're going to disagree on what follows. Right. <coughs> so I spoke about incentives, active safety, and passive safety. So as much as the Darwin is quite aligned in the sense that the, the traders only get compensated for success, there's still a problem that we call moral hazard in economic terms, and that is... If the trader wins, he keeps 20% investor success fee. If the trader loses, it's only the investor who has lost. Of course, the trader is trading his own money, so there is some element of skin that the trader has in his game, and that's why we publish, for instance, how much money the Darwins of their own account are holding in their account. So the bigger, the better, the, the less moral hazard you've got. But... There's no denying that for the best Darwins, there's a lot more investor interest than there is trader skin in the game. So, And this is a bit of an asymmetric game in the sense that investors stand to lose more than the trader himself, which means the, the trader is sort of incentivized to take extra risks. Now, because that's the case, you need to put a layer of risk management. And that layer has to be, to in, to be independent from the trader. Okay. That's the first point. The second point is, and this one is more difficult, but more important even to explain. And it's called, you know, the difference between understanding risk, which is forward looking, and drawdown, which is backward looking. Right. And the best way I can think of is explaining the game of Russian roulette. I don't know if you guys have watched it. I think there's a 1979 movie called The uh, Deer Hunter which I think is one of my favorite movies of all, all time. It's a, it's a pretty good tale of, of uh, friendship, but I think it's also a very graphic way to explain statistics. Now, the guy who holds his gun makes a living for quite some time by playing Russian roulette, okay? Now, the fact that he's still got the, you know, the photograph and he's still there, it means his brain is all in one piece, which means he hasn't lost a bet or a trade in the past, okay? Now, I'm trying to make an analogy here. Uh, and the analogy is that this guy is taking some risk. Now, but looking back, what is this guy's drawdown when he plays? And I need some engagement here, guys. Come on, go for it. Okay, Vitor has said it's, his drawdown is zero. Fantastic. Does everybody agree? It's drawdown is zero. Okay, what is the guy's risk? Okay, so the guys are saying it, it's 100%. Yeah, I need you guys to be more specific. So the, right, the risk is life. Yeah, but what is the chance that this guy blows his brain in the next, in the next, not the last, in the next trial of the, of the relational roulette? Okay, David has said one to six. Obviously, David is a, is a pretty clever guy. He knows that revolvers have uh, six... A potential bullets in there 
and he has assumed that this guy is playing a standard Russian roulette game of 1 over 6, uh, 16%. Now, we don't know. That's the point. So it's really down to the trader to choose for his next experiment. Maybe there's no bullet, in which case the risk is zero. Maybe there's one bullet, in which the case it's 1 over 6. Or maybe there's three bullets, in which the case it's 50%. Obviously, I mean, unless the guy really wants to commit suicide, it will not be uh, 6 over 6. But maybe he enters in some sort of really fucked up game where he says, okay, you know, uh, you pay me $100,000 if I play this with 1 over 6, but you, may, you pay me $10 million if I play with, with 2 over 6. Right? Yeah, correct. So everybody's now saying it depends on the number of bullets, on the number of holes and the number of bullets. The point is, though, that the only person who knows this is the trader. Right? And he's the only one to decide for the next shot. So we could be very, very stupid and conclude that the fact that he has had zero drawdown in the past means that he hasn't incurred any risk. But we can still be very stupid by thinking that his next, that we know his next risk. That's a quite easy mistake to, to make, thinking, oh, the fact that he had a one over six risk in the past means that, that he will have a one over six risk in the future. And the answer is, we don't know. Why don't we know? Because it's controlled by the trader and we don't know what the trader is up to. Okay, I hope, I mean, I think we're all on, 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 the same, on the same page because a lot of people go around trader forums and go, oh, this strategy is good. It has a low drawdown. And basically, that's, you know, that guy knows fuck all, unfortunately, about statistics, but he thinks he does, which is the most dangerous thing. Okay, now, how do we try to solve for this? Well, by introducing one core difference between a Darwin and a strategy, okay? With a strategy... The target risk, as we've seen, is unknown. We don't know how many bullets the trader will try and put in his revolver for the next round. We want him to take some bullets because he needs to take risk to make money. We just don't want to take him more than we're expecting. So if we pay the guy to put one bullet over six, that's fine. That's the game we're playing. The problem is, unless you hand out control to an, an independent party, you will never know. And that's exactly what the Darwin does, okay? So we try and guarantee to the investor that he knows how much risk he's taking. So in this case, what we do is, okay, let's play the game of Russian roulette, but instead of the trader, it's going to be Darwin X who puts the, the bullet and the revolver. Now, there's a standard measure of risk, which call, we call value at risk, which measures the probability of losing a given amount with 5% uh, probability in the next month. Okay, So what does a 10% monthly value at risk? By the way, this is incidentally the, the level of risk we target, the, the bullets we put in the Darwin's revolver, so to say, is a value percent of, of uh, at risk of 10% means that the trader is expected to lose 10% or more in the worst month every 20 trading months. That's what it means. Okay, so that's what the risk, the target risk is. Core difference between a Darwin and a strategy, the target risk for a strategy is unknown. The target risk for a Darwin is known because Darwin X vouches under its asset management license for an algorithm that is targeting 10% value at risk. That is the core difference I mean, you can think of, if you bear with me, you can think of, of the previous bit of the presentation as bullshit. Now, this is what really matters. It's the risk management on top of the legality. It's all linked to each other, but it, this is where the rubber hits the road. How do we achieve that? Well, by unbundling the three key decisions in a trade. When we're thinking of the strategy, most traders think that what matters is to pick the right asset at the right time. Unfortunately, most novice traders think only don't even pay attention to how much leverage they take on as they pick the long euro dollar position now. And uh, you know, being right about the euro dollar can make you rich in the long run, but being wrong about the leverage can make you poor, can blow your money very, very, very quickly. 
Okay, now we are a broker, so the trader is free to do whatever he wants with his own strategy. We don't control that. However, we do something with a Darwin. So the Darwin will trade whatever the trader chose, 0.1 seconds typically after the trader chose it. However, the investor leverage is for Darwin to manage. So in this case, I've just made up an example. It could be that the trader is trading 25 to 1 leverage and the investors in the Darwin are trading a 3 to 1 leverage, which has been not been set by the trader, but by Darwin X themselves. Okay, this is the key difference. Now, this doesn't only happen at the when you trade at, uh, open a trade, it happens throughout the life of a trade. So opening a trade of 25 to 1 leverage for two minutes is probably not too much uh, risk unless you do this during news releases. If you open a trade with 25 to 1 risk, uh, risk for a week, that is pretty much a bit like you know playing Russian roulette, right? So what we do is we control the leverage when the trade opens. And regularly throughout the life of a trade, we check whether that trade is open for too long and the risk manager would close some of the risk from investors, even if the trader had chosen to do nothing. The best way I've come up with summarizing this is that the trader picks what and when investors trade, but it's actually investors who pick the investor leverage. Did that make sense? For an explanation, that, that is the core difference between the Darwin and the trader strategy. So, and I'll work through an example to, for you guys to understand how it works. Uh, as I said, the handout is available from us, so you can download this thing later and try and work out the numbers in your head. But essentially, what we're doing here is okay. So let's do, let's work through the work example. So let's say we've got a trader who typically trades 50% value at risk with his own money. Now, if you're familiar with uh, the risk stability and risk adjustment grades, you will know that they encourage you to keep both your value at risk for the overall strategy and the risk adjustment, which is the leverage per trade, roughly constant. Now, if you hold the value at risk and then uh, the, the leverage per trade and the number of trades constant, then you have a roughly constant value at risk. And what we can say is say, okay, well, if the investors want the 10% value at risk and the trader starts with 50% value at risk, what we do is we solve back by dividing one for the other. So if the trader typically trades 10 to 1 leverage to achieve this 50% value at risk, the investors will be trading 2 to 1 leverage because the ratio of 10 to 50 is 1 over 5, and that's what 2 to 1 is to 10 over 50. So 10 to 1 times 10% divided by 50% is 2 to 1 investor leverage. That's how the basis of the risk manager works. All we're doing here is solving for a target value at risk, assuming that the trader holds his own value at risk constant. Now, what happens if, for whatever reason, the trader deviates from his typical 10 to 1 leverage and instead he pushes a trade for 15 to 1 leverage? Well, you know, this is bigger than the typical 10 to 1, but we grant the trader a bit of leeway. Perhaps, you know, he thinks high convic conviction trades, that there's a number of reasons why he might want to do that. So, 50% deviation is within the tolerated deviation, so we would not intervene. In this case, because you know, uh, by the same rule, instead of the, the ingoing signal by the trader was 15 to 1 instead of the typical 10 to 1, 15 to 1 is 50% above 10 to 1, therefore, 3 to 1 is what the investors trade. I hope that makes sense. Now, what would happen if instead if the trader really pushed it? Okay, if instead of 15 to 1, he just went for 30 to 1, and that was outside the maximum tolerance, which say was at 20 to 1. What is the investor leverage then? Well, what happens is because um, 30 to 1 is above the 20 to 1, what we do is, okay, 20 is two-thirds of 30, so one-third of the risk is too much. So we're going to shave one-third of whatever would have resulted by dividing the sharp ratio. So we basically say two-thirds times 30 to 1 times 10 value at risk over 50 uh, value at risk, which amounts to a 4 to 1 uh, amount of leverage here. Okay, so the trader is still allowed to push it, but not as much as he would want. 
and he's going to be penalized in both his risk appetite, uh, sorry, his risk adjustment and his risk stability grades, which means he has just worsened his investor appeal. Okay, so we're basically trying to make sure that the risk manager only intervenes if it must, but if it must intervene, it will intervene. Right, so Shane, this is the, there's a question here which is comes up quite often. So when a trader is trading at 10 to 1 leverage, when then what percentage of his trading account is he risking? Okay, this percent, uh, I mean, uh, this is going to sound a bit like heresy, but risking a percentage of your account is an incomplete measure of risk because you're not accounting for how likely it is to lose that percentage. Okay, so let me put it this way. You could basically trade and put your stop loss in a way such that you lose 1% with 10 to 1 of leverage and whatever the stop loss is so that this amounts to 1% loss. So 10, 10, 10 to leverage and accordingly placed stop loss. Or you could choose to basically say, okay, I'm going to go 1,000 to 1 leverage, but a much, much tighter stop loss. Am I risking the same by doing these two thought experiments? So yes, if I hit the stop loss, I will have lost 1% of the account. But which of the two is more likely? This is a key, key, key thing that, that you guys must understand. And, and Shane, thanks a lot for asking this because this is the the way to really make you know make the hit the whole thing home. Okay, so it is more likely that the larger leverage will stop out. So which of the two is riskier? The one K is more likely. Correct. The risk amount value is the same, and that is not that. That's why so the the expected value of the bet is not the same, because in case you hit the stop loss, you will have lost one percent in both cases. But the one thousand to one is far more likely than the ten to one, and therefore it's a lot more risky to trade the thousand to one than the ten to one. And that's why looking at percentage of account lost is a is a bad way of thinking of risk management. And, you know, Shane, it's not like I'm taking it out on you. Right? I mean, like everybody and the mother, including teachers, go around ignoring this, which is ignoring basic stats. And actually, very good point, because that brings me back to the whole active safety versus passive safety situation. The 1,000 to 1 is the active safety, reducing the probability. The, the stop loss is... Okay, well, I'll accept that the shit happened, but at least I'm going to try and stop it. But I've already, you know, there's a good thing, I've stopped it, but there's a bad thing is that I've locked it in. Okay, so, and, and that's, that's a pretty good way to summarize the whole thing. So, I mean, uh, just to close off, there are trades that the, tr the risk manager does, which are not done not triggered by the trader. So if a trader hangs on to a trade for too long, then the risk manager will gradually close him out and trigger trades that the trader didn't, uh, for the investors, that the trader didn't trigger himself. And th by the way, this is one of the reasons, for instance, that it will be difficult to offer Darwin's uh, on futures with small contract sizes because these risk management trades are typically very granular, very small, and uh, you cannot do that with, um, with the huge contract sizes that futures typically have. Okay. So... Let's come back to the four layers of safety and come back to Shane's example. I mean, uh, Shane, thank you so much because you've been the, 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 best, uh, the best attendee to the, to the webinar. You've basically allowed me to, to, to make the, the flow more compelling. So the first incentive is, so the first thing is incentives. So we make sure that the trader his own, has his own skin and reputation in the game. Uh, and so that will encourage him to not go for crazy leverage. Then, of course, the trader, because of the incentives, will be very strongly incentivized to have his own stop loss and take profits. That will be the passive safety device number one. But then on top of that, we have two things. The first one is the risk manager, which sets the leverage, which 
implies the probability of hitting the stop loss uh, in, uh, as per the discussion we just had, which you can think of in terms of the car analogy as this is the, on the one hand, it's kind of the cruise control or a speed limit. So the car could do 200 miles an hour, but we're only going to allow this guy to drive at 60. Does this mean it will not be able to, to have an accident? No, but it, it brings the probability of having an accident to within what the legal speeds imply. And also, and I'm actually happy to report today, uh, we have released the stop loss and take profit orders on the live Darwin environment. So from today, you can already basically set a stop loss on your Darwin investments as an investor. So let's recap. So the trader has no incentive to lose. He, Because he has no incentive to lose because he's risking his own money, he will have his own stops or he will have a pretty bad uh, discipline scores. So he will be penalized for not trading with stops. Then the risk manager intervenes to minimize the chance of a, to, no, to, to manage the chance of an accident to within the expected risk capital of 10% value at risk. And then on top of that, if you're not comfortable with the risk manager, you can now also set up your stop losses on the, on the, on the Darwin, which brings the whole thing round term. So the reputation in the game, Vitor, is the, the Darwin X score. So if you, you fuck up your, your uh, risk stability and reduce risk adjustment, your, your Darwin X score goes down and investors stop seeing you. You lose visibility. So what does the risk manager do when the trade moves to break even to take out the risk? And the answer is nothing, provided the, the leverage stays within, within range. We, Michael, we don't want the, the risk manager to manage the strategy for you. The risk manager is there to protect the investors in case you do something silly. But it doesn't do anything itself. So, uh, Alexander, so if the strategy doesn't use a stop loss, so you would see that in the, in the loss aversion and the negative excursion. So, it's we don't really... So if, I guess the, the question you're asking is, does the, the score take into account whether you have set your stop loss? And the answer is, it doesn't know until it's triggered. So if your pending order is actually triggered, then you would not be penalized for that. Now, there's a bonus to all this. Uh, so, last question by Michael. So, uh, he's asking whether the 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 the, the, um, uh, the risk manager will partially close uh, a trade if it stays uh, open for a long time. So, the the term a long time is relative to your typical duration. So, if you typically stay in for for days, then the risk manager will expect you to to stay in for days. But if you typically trade for minutes, then it will actually get nervous if you trade for days. And uh, whether or not it actually hits in, you would see if you go to the risk adjustment. I've just gone to the interface. You go to the risk adjustment uh, um, chart, and you can basically see any red dots mean the risk manager had to intervene. If everything is green with you, it did intervene. And if if it, if you see something red, then you can work back from the dot. You can both go back to the underlying strategy chart and see which position got closed out and you can figure out how sensitive it is. You can basically work that out and answer for yourself by looking at the interface, I guess, Michael. That's the answer. Uh, so Shane is asking whether the drawdown is in relative to the, to the initial starting balance and the answer is yes. So uh, Michael is coming back again, uh, even if, if the trade is at break-even. So uh, the fact that a trade is at break-even or not break-even doesn't even feature in the equation. We can take that offline if you want, Michael. Happy to discuss uh, of, of, of the record. So the, the risk manager is not looking for profit profits. It's because uh, the profit is backward looking. The, the the profit is related to where you started the position. The risk is forward looking. It's how much it could move from where it is now. So it's you know whether it's in profit or loss, it's neither here nor there for risk. Okay, so I just wanted to walk you through a couple of bonuses. The first one, which is kind of pretty overlooked, is that all Darwins are apples to apples comparable for risk. 
And because they are apples to apples comparable for risk, they're also apples to apples comparable for return. That means people get the visibility that risk return warrants, not just the, the gross return, which could be with gross risk. Okay, so that's one bonus. The second one is that you can compare your Darwin risk with a stock. For instance, uh, the Apple stock has a value at risk of 10%, which is about the same as a Darwin. If you want to play around with value at risks, go to this application called Y charts and you can figure out the value at risk of different financial assets. So you can relate between a Darwin, which is value at risk, and another financial asset. And also there's another bonus, and that is because all Darwins are the same risk, and we also measure the correlation, you know roughly what the risk of a portfolio of Darwins is. So once you have five Darwins in your portfolio, you're roughly at the same risk as the S&P 500, which means we're trying to create an asset here that you can compare with alternative options for your, for your wallet. And that was pretty much it. I think we've, we've been having quite a bit more of Q&A at the end of this. Um, there is, uh, we've already planned the next webinar where we'll discuss the differences between Darwin's and marketing signals, MAMs, or execution advisors or hedge funds. I would be delighted to have you with us. And if you have any suggestions on how to do other webinars or do webinars better, we have a lot to learn. Please let us know because I'm, I'm a very humble student of all this and uh, I need to get better. I appreciate that. So thank you guys. Uh, if there's no more questions, I have to dash off because I have to cover the uh, Spanish and French versions of this in, uh, in four and respectively one hour, <laughs> four minutes and one hour from now. So it's been a real pleasure. And uh, yeah, no, th thanks for, I, I, will, I will have a better, a better throat next time. Apologies for that, guys. Real pleasure, guys. Take care. I hopefully see you on the next one. It's always going to be Tuesdays about this time. So I would love it to have you around every Tuesday. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.